As a college undergraduate, I'm constantly asked the following chain of questions. What do you do? I'm a student. Where do you go? Westmont College. What's your major? Political science and biology. And here they take a second to process that, yes, I did say I'm do studying a hard science and a social science? Uh, social science joke for all of you in political science. Uh, and they ask with deep concern in your voice, what do you hope to do with that? Well, never fear, mother dear. We have with us tonight a man who has PhDs in both biology and political science and has managed professional success. There's hope for us double majors yet. Dominic Johnson received a uh, Doctor of Philosophy from Oxford University in Evolutionary Biology and a PhD from Geneva University in Political Science. He has all appointments at Stanford, Princeton, Harvard, and University of Edinburgh. He's currently the Ulster Bachman Chair of International Politics at Oxford and has authored numerous scientific journal articles and publications, including the book, Overconfidence in War, The Havoc and, Havoc and Glory of Positive Illusions, He's also contributed to the book Failing to Win, Perceptions and Victory, uh, Perceptions of Victory and Defeat in International Politics. His most recent book, which we'll be speaking on tonight, is God is Watching You, How the Fear of God Makes Us Human. God is Watching You examines the role of religion and evolution of cooperation, and how cross-culturally how cross-culturally ubiquitous and ancient beliefs in supernatural punishment have helped overcome major challenges in human cooperation. Our senior capstone course has been reading and dissecting Dr. Johnson's work. The topic has so intrigued me that I convinced myself to order a, another school book. Uh, on behalf of the BioLit class, we hope you are intrigued by Dr. Johnson's work as much as we have been. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Johnson to the podium. Thank you very much for that very nice introduction, Andrew. And uh, I'm delighted to hear <coughs> that uh, students are taking political science and biology. There's a great future in it, I believe, so uh, stick with it. Thank you for coming. It's a hot evening. I'm sure uh, there's various swimming pools that you could be in instead, um, but hopefully we'll have an interesting conversation tonight. Um, so the title of the talk is God is Watching You, Supernatural Punishment and the Evolution of Cooperation. And what this book and this project is, is uh, an attempt to take religion seriously from a scientific perspective. And I should start by saying I'm an atheist and was trained as an evolutionary biologist. And for this reason, I became particularly interested in understanding religion um, in terms of its adaptive functions for human uh, life. And that's what uh, I will explain in, in further detail. So, so much has been written about religion. Um, what could possibly be new? And the new element really is that there is an increasing number of people um, trying to understand religion from an evolutionary perspective. So this is a synthesis of work in anthropology and psychology um, and some, some neuroscience as well, which is starting to um, form a picture of how religion um, originated in human societies and the kinds of functions it has um, for human society and human cooperation. Now, as an evolutionary biologist, I was particularly struck by what I would call the puzzle of religion. Um, it may not seem like a puzzle to the assembled audience here tonight, but from the point of evolutionary biology, where we're trying to understand um, adaptive functions of, of behaviour and physiology, religion is interesting because it's costly. It's costly in terms of time, in resources, um, in opportunity costs, and the effort that it takes to follow any particular religious tradition. Of course, these are some extreme examples, but... Um, one can think of many others which are much, much less, but take up time in everyday life in one form or another. There are also very extreme examples like uh, the one we talked about earlier at dinner, the Shakers, um, which are celibate. And for 300 years, they survived by having converts come into the religious community. Um, but they have never reproduced themselves. And over time, it's declined, and there are now three of them left in the Sabbath Day Lake community in Maine. So for an evolutionary biologist, that's a really interesting puzzle. So the question could be, why hasn't natural selection stamped out religion if it's so costly? Now, this may remind you of another evolutionary biologist, Richard Dawkins, um, who's already made evolutionary arguments about the origins of religion, um, but very different ones. He argues that um, religion is a mistake, that it's a parasitic meme, an idea which is very good at spreading but in itself is not adaptive. My take is very different. There can be many different evolutionary theories of religion, 
And on the left, you have non-adaptive theories, um, which argue that um, religion is a byproduct of cognitive mechanisms which we evolved for other reasons. And religion is an accident, which is a spillover of these um, cognitive mechanisms. It might be a maladaptation, something that's arisen for some other reason, but does not necessarily help us. Now, interestingly, Richard Dawkins' um, meme theory would actually belong on this side of the graph, because it's an adaptive theory. It's an explanation of how an idea can be adaptive in that it's very good at spreading, even if it has negative consequences for those who um, hold the meme. But there are other interesting adaptive theories which, until recently, had not really been explored in any great detail. And these are essentially whether religion provides functional advantages for believers. And I'm going to focus tonight on individual level adaptations, which are um, rewards or benefits which come from religious belief um, to the individual. So here's an outline of my talk. Um, the puzzle of religion that I started with. I want to turn next to another puzzle, the puzzle of cooperation. Then I'll suggest that supernatural punishment, beliefs in supernatural punishment, might be a solution to this problem. And then I want to get into the details of whether people really do fear supernatural punishment, and if they do, whether it affects their behaviour. So why focus on punishment? This is Darwin, and one of the great puzzles that he faced was explaining altruism or cooperation in nature. So here's a honeybee, and honeybees are amazing because they will um, sacrifice their own lives to defend the colony. Actually, there's some biologists in the room. Is this a honeybee? I hope so. <laughs> <laughs> now, biologists have, since Darwin, solved the problem of why some organisms will sacrifice their own lives to help others, or at least sacrifice time and effort to help others. Many of these solutions um, arose after Darwin died, so he was never witness to um, the solutions that we've um, developed for explaining altruism in nature. But the four key ones are Bill Hamilton's idea that sacrifice um, makes sense because the individual sacrifices for the benefit of others who share the same genes. Bob Trivers came up with reciprocal altruism. Perhaps I sacrifice for you because tomorrow you'll sacrifice for me. Richard Alexander argued that uh, that reciprocity doesn't always have to be between individuals. Perhaps I sacrifice to Jeff and other people observe this um, and are nice to me in return. And it could be a costly signal. I'm willing to sacrifice resources to someone uh, because by doing so I'm demonstrating um, the ability to be generous and perhaps that I have good genes and therefore other benefits will come in other ways. Now these mechanisms have been extremely successful in explaining animal cooperation. And they also explain human cooperation. Human cooperation can be explained in many cases by kin selection, by reciprocal altruism, by indirect reciprocity and by signaling. But not all human cooperation can be explained. And specific experiments have been conducted that rule out those possibilities for return benefits and still find that humans are very cooperative. So even though we've solved the problem of the puzzle of cooperation in nature among animals, we haven't solved the puzzle of human cooperation. We know, it's very obvious if we look around us, that humans cooperate even in very large groups where there are no kin, there is no reciprocity, there's no reputational effects and there's no signaling. So we're, we're left with this puzzle. What explains our remarkable, voluntary, costly cooperation? Now, these are the results of a public goods game. It's a common form of experiment that economists, behavioural economists <coughs> often use to study whether and when people will cooperate to provide some collective good. And this is a, a very typical result from one of these experiments. And what happens is, over several rounds of the experiment, you have to decide how much money you want to put into a common pot, which is then multiplied by some amount and then shared out among everyone. So if everyone puts all of their money in the pot, it's multiplied by something, so you get more than you put in. But this is just the empirical data from a typical experiment on how much people actually put in. Now the maximum in this case was uh, 20 MU's monetary units. This was a Swiss experiment. One monetary unit equaled one piece of Swiss chocolate. <laughs> and what you find is, typically, people put in about half of the amount they're given at the beginning of the experiment. They're not all that generous. They give something, but not everything. 
But the most important thing about these experiments is that the cooperation declines over time. You observe that other people have not given their full amount, um, and you reduce your contribution accordingly. And this increases over time until cooperation collapses. But this experiment was very uh, important because it showed what happens if you introduce punishment. So you could argue that a lot of political science and a lot of economics is about solving this problem, the collective action problem. How do we get self-interested individuals um, to be more generous so that everyone can benefit as a result? Well, there are lots of ways to do it, but one very effective way is to add the possibility for punishment. In this, in this experiment, at this point, halfway through the rounds of playing this game, they allowed people to punish pe others who were not contributing much to the pot. Immediately, just learning this was possible, contributions jumped up significantly, and then amazingly they actually increased over time until it was almost perfect cooperation by the end. So it's not the only way of solving the collective action problem, but punishment is a really good way of solving the collective action problem. Now, that was published in Nature in 2002, and you might think, wow, it took us a long time to figure that out. But if you look around the world, it's actually really intuitive. This is uh, Lady Justice standing on top of the Old Bailey Courthouse in London. And um, it's really interesting to note that she holds the scales for fairness and justice. But in her other hand is a sword. And most cultures um, around the world have discovered that in order to have an effective system of justice and policing, you can't just have um, fairness for, it, uh, for its own sake. You have to have some mechanism of enforcement. You have to have punishment for cooperation to succeed. So the game theory suggests that while rewards are effective at encouraging cooperation, they're not good enough. They can induce some people to cooperate, but they cannot prevent all of us from cheating. And you only have to have a few cheats for cooperation to unravel like in the game. Punishment is very different. It's not just the opposite of rewards. It's actually more effective because it raises the cost of defection above the cost of cooperation. So it means that cheating is no longer possible and it can um, not only increase the initial level of cooperation but sustain it over time. So there is something special, I would argue, about punishment. It's really interesting that not just in game theory but in psychology you find a similar asymmetry in the power of punishment. So we know that uh, human brains are particularly sensitive to negative events. Um, Roy Baumeister has this big review article um, which he called bad is stronger than good. And this was a synthesis of hundreds of studies showing that people are much more responsive to negative events than they are to similarly um, equivalent positive events. This study by Morwedge at the bottom is really interesting to me because he showed that we're actually more likely to attribute agency, that means we're looking around searching for the cause of something if it's a negative event. Much more than if it's a positive event. The problem with punishment, so far I've argued that it's an effective way of solving the collective action problem. The problem with punishment is that it in itself is costly. So then you have this problem of second order free riders. First order free riders are the people who don't contribute to the pot and reap the benefits of the public good that everyone else has paid for. Second order free riders are the good citizens that do contribute to their taxes or to their pot in the game. But they don't want to take on the cost of punishing um, defectors. So this raises a really important problem. We observe empirically that punishment is effective, but how do we get there? And in particular, again in the evolutionary context where we want to understand the origins and development of, of human cooperation throughout the course of human evolution, it's hard to see how punishment was maintained. Don't think about modern societies, think about early indigenous societies. External institutions today are effective at punishing, but those are very modern innovations. Small-scale societies don't have punishing institutions. Perhaps punishment is not costly after all. Maybe it's actually quite cheap to punish others. But the game theory, th theory shows that it doesn't matter how costly punishment is, even if it incurs some tiny cost of the use of time to do it. Um, as long as it's greater than zero, then it eventually is selected out for population. Perhaps you have other people who punish those who don't punish. But then you have to have other people who 
punish those who don't punish those who don't punish. <laughs> so that's not seen as a credible argument either. Now the experiment I showed you by Ernst Fair and Simon Gachter, the Swiss experiment, their argument was that human beings actually have a disposition to altruistically punish, as they called it. That we have a, a disposition that motivates us to punish others, even if it's costly to ourselves. But this is at least uh, hotly disputed. I think it's wrong, um, but it remains a, a, a debate in the literature. Certainly, we have this problem to explain how punishment emerged. And at this point, back in 2002, I was just curious that no one had mentioned the problem might be solved not by material punishment, but by beliefs in supernatural punishment. Now, it might not apply to the economic students in the economic games, but if you look around the world, billions of people do believe um, in supernatural punishment um, for violations of social norms. So what might be the effect of supernatural punishment? And uh, my wife got me to remove most of the jokes I had in my talk. <laughs> this one has stayed in. Here's God at his computer, and he has a special key called Smite. He can <laughs> drop pianos on uh, defectors and cheats. So purely from the, the game theoretical point of view, I think supernatural punishment is really interesting. You don't have a second order free rider problem because no individual has to punish. The burden is put on to another agent altogether. There are no reprisals against punishment, um, against those who punish. That's one of the, the concerns about punishment as well. Why would you punish if you're perhaps going to be retaliated against? No one can retaliate against God. Some other advantages, again, from the purely sort of game theoretical point of view, is that cheats are automatically detected. You don't have to discover them. You don't have to find them. Um, if it's an omniscient God, he knows. They're automatically punished. Right? And if that all is effective, then you have fewer forced first order free riders in the first place. So at least in principle, there are some reasons why supernatural punishment might be really powerful. Now at this point, I just want to I keep saying God, but it's very important to remember that, um, again, thinking of the evolutionary context of small-scale human societies before we developed into large, um, urbanized, settled um, civilizations, the same logic applies. They might not be omniscient, omnipresent gods, but there are all sorts of different supernatural agents which are deemed to um, have consequences for those who violate social norms. Now, we were talking about Hawaii earlier. And as far as I know, this is Ku, the god of war and fertility. And it's just one example of the many different types of supernatural agents around the world and in indigenous societies and religions, um, which are seen to, to punish violations of social norms. There are many others. Well, we have lots of anecdotal evidence that religion is effective at promoting cooperation. And here's an Amish community building someone's barn. But what we really need is um, to ask deeper questions about whether we have good empirical evidence which demonstrate that people fear supernatural punishment. So this is the next bit of the talk. Do people fear supernatural punishment <coughs> actually? Well, here's some data. This is a, an international poll by uh, an organization called Zogby, and they specifically asked um, several hundred people in different nations around the world whether they believed they will suffer negative consequences if they disobey their religion. And here are the results from a bunch of different cultures and religions within those cultures. Um, so it's not everyone, but a very large proportion of people declare that they will suffer negative consequences if they disobey their religion. And in some societies, it is an extremely significant proportion, 95% in India and Saudi Arabia. Now, that's modern societies. And again, I keep mentioning early societies, if we want to understand the origins and evolution of religion, we have to think about early societies before they became large. This is a famous study by an anthropologist called Guy Swanson, and he looked in detail at 50 small-scale indigenous societies around the world, and he found that 92% of them had at least one of the following things. Moralizing gods, active ancestral spirits, which influence the lives of the living, some beliefs in reincarnation, and then specific supernatural sanctions on health or misfortunes in life or the afterlife. 
Here's another study by George Murdoch, another anthropologist, who looked systematically at 186 pre-industrial societies around the world. And his project was to look at what do people believe are the causes of illness? And he found that every single one of these societies believed that illness was triggered by a supernatural cause, a supernatural agent or agency, um, in response to something that you might have done wrong. This is a much more recent study by yet another anthropologist called Chris Bohm at USC. And he <coughs> didn't like the fact that these large quantitative studies were looking at all sorts of very different types of societies. And he picked out just 18, but 18 which he believed represented the kinds of small-scale societies that we would have lived in over the very important um, two million years or so of the Pleistocene when humans um, uh, evolved very much into um, modern humans. And he argued that um, from his research, 100% of them um, believed in supernatural sanctions to enforce local moral codes. This is uh, Harvey Whitehouse's list of so-called recurrent cross-cultural features of religion. And this is another anthropologist, uh, again more recently, who's studied a lot of different cultures around the world. And he's observed that there are certain things which are common to those religions. They don't always have all of these things, but these are things which recur commonly. And among them are moral obligation, punishment and reward, and beliefs in the afterlife. So this little survey has shown us at least some data suggesting that this is not just something about uh, um, an aspect of Christianity, for example, or an aspect of some particular religion which has beliefs in punishment. It's actually really widespread among many different religions. And uh, Ed Wilson has estimated there's been about 10,000 religions in the history of uh, human civilizations. Um, and this is an attempt to try and get a sense of how common punishment is among uh, at least a sample of those, and it seems to be very common indeed. <coughs> so belief in supernatural punishment is common across modern, ancient, and small-scale societies. It's diverse sources of supernatural punishment, not always God, but also gods and ancestors and spirits and witches and sorcerers and so on. Interestingly as well, those supernatural punishments are often linked to what I would call fitness-critical events. These are things which really impact biological fitness and survival. They're things like reproduction, uh, food, hunting, crops, weather, seasons, public goods, antisocial behavior, and so on. They're not about random things. They're about things which are really important to successful um, survival and reproduction. And I think what matters here, and especially if I was talking to an audience of skeptical evolutionary biologists who don't, in say Oxford, who don't um, think much about religion, I think the point is that if people believe it, then whether it's real or not, supernatural punishment can have important implications for explaining people's behavior. So now on to the next thing. Okay, there's some data that it's a common belief. But does that belief actually alter their behavior? So here there's a growing number of studies which range from experimental studies, field studies, cross-cultural studies. And I'll just give a couple of examples of each. And I think in the interest of time, I might not go through all of them. Let me pick out some, uh, a few. But this is a fun one. This is a Jesse Bering study where he did an experiment and he had two groups of people come into a building and take a test. It was a maths test. One group just came in and did the test. The other group came in and were told this fabricated story that the test had been designed by a graduate student who had sadly recently died and uh, passingly mentioned that um, people had said they'd heard his voice in the building. So kind of suggesting that there was the ghost of this uh, dead student who had set up the, the test. And then they just looked at whether these people cheated on the test. There was a glitch in the computer program which flashed up the answer. And if that happened, they were supposed to press the space bar. The space bar. So the measure in this experiment was how quickly people hit the space bar to get rid of the answer so they wouldn't mess up the test. So it was a measure of cheating, essentially. And here's what they found. So in the control group, <coughs> where they did not have any ghost story. They took a long time to press the space bar, right? They said, I'll have a quick look at the answer and add that into my test result. And they earned money from doing well in the test. Mm -hmm. At the other end, in white, is the ghost story. These are the people who um, were mentioned that there was this ghost in the building. And they were much less likely to wait to press the space bar. So they were less likely to cheat. The one in the middle was the kind of um, 
uh, in between treatment group where they were told about the student dying but not the suggestion that there had been a ghost in the building. So it's a bit of a fun study, uh, that's why I've picked it out, but Jesse Baring argued that this suggested at least that when people are primed um, to believe there's a supernatural agent present, they're less likely to cheat. And I'm not going to give every example. I will give this one because this came up over dinner. This is um, Azim Sharif and, uh, Sharif and Aaron <coughs> and Zion. And they did another study where they measured people's level of cheating. But here they wanted to nuance a little bit what people were um, concerned about in terms of the supernatural agent. And they asked people specifically what kind of God they believed in. And on the right, these are people who believed in a God that was... Punishing, vengeful, harsh, fearsome, angry, jealous. It wasn't binary, um, but it was a sort of continuous scale of how much they assigned those attributes to their particular God. And these data over here <coughs> actually tended to believe God was forgiving, loving, compassionate, gentle, and kind. Now, what these shows are the uh, correlation coefficients with cheating. And because they're pointing down here, that um, is telling us that <coughs> those people who believed in the punishing God were less likely to cheat. So exactly in line with the supernatural punishment theory. Now this stuff over here is a real puzzle because these are statistically significant as well. But those are people who believed in a benevolent loving God and were more likely to cheat. And they don't have a good explanation for that. But if we look at the right-hand side of the graph, we've got some support for the theory. Field studies. So you can think of lots of historical examples where um, belief in um, punishing gods may have actually promoted cooperation and here's the Puritans um, at their first Thanksgiving in America um, had very interesting beliefs in um, supernatural consequences for antisocial and uh, amoral behaviour and I suggest in the book that that helped them survive their first winter uh, among other things and help they had. But there's been some attempts to study this um, with data. This is Richard Sosis's study of um, 19th century utopian communities. These are small communities which set themselves aside from mainstream American culture and uh, live <coughs> independently. Some of them are religious, some of them are secular. And what Richard Sosis did is just track how long do they survive. And the dashed line are the survival rates of the religious communes. And the black line are the survival rates of the secular communes. And he observed that there is something about the religious communes which allow them to survive longer. And he argued it's because they're much more um, successful at cooperating. I'm going to skip that one. This one came up in the discussion at dinner as well. So let me just describe this one. This was very important because this one specific, that the study I just showed you didn't tell us anything explicit about supernatural punishment beliefs. This one does. This was a, pu a study published in Nature last year, looking at eight different societies around the world and asking subjects in the experiment specifically uh, the degree to which they believed um, their um, God punished. So they had this moralistic God's punishment index along the bottom um, on a scale of zero to one. So these are people who believed that their God was very punishing these are people who believe their God is not particularly punishing. And then the bars are showing us how much um, money they allocated to someone else that they didn't know, but who shared their same religion. So <coughs> overall, people did not give all of their money away to someone else. They kept some of it for themselves. But the more they believed in a, po a moralizing, punishing God, the more money they were willing to give away to a stranger who shared their same beliefs. So a couple of examples of cross-cultural studies as well. And again, just to remind ourselves, the whole point of all of these studies is to provide you some evidence that the fear of supernatural punishment actually affects people's cooperative behaviour. Uh, this is a study I did. It's the same 186 societies that George Murdoch studied in the theories of illness uh, example I gave you earlier. And here I looked at um, a variable called high gods. And this is a measure that anthropologists have come up with um, to describe how moralising... Um, gods in those societies were deemed to be. And then I looked at um, society level correlates of cooperative behaviour. And here's what I found. So this was a statistical study and there were statistical relationships between how moralising the gods were and the size of the groups. They were able to get bigger. 
And you can only do that if you're very cooperative and cohesive. They were more compliant with social norms. Um, they were more likely to loan and use abstract money, which of course requires high levels of trust. They were also more likely to have central sanctions and uh, sort of rudimentary uh, policing. And they were also more likely to pay taxes. Now, there's lots of potential questions there about what's going on. But again, there's some, at least some correlational evidence cross-culturally that there is an association between belief in moralizing, punishing gods, and uh, the levels of cooperation that these societies attain. And I did control for region and the influence of, of Western religions which had begun to come into these societies. Again, I'm not going to give you every example here, so let me skip this one to another fun one, which is sort of controversial but interesting. This is back to Azim Sharif again. Here's a study where he looked at crime rates across countries around the world. And he's got this funny measure here, which takes a little while to get your head around. But basically, the further right you are, the more people in that nation believe in a punishing God than a benevolent God. And what he found was a statistical relationship that um, crime rates were higher among societies that had lower beliefs in a punishing God relative to a, a benevolent God. Um, and as we discussed at dinner, he got a lot of flack for this because there are many things going on, you know, to um, influence these data. But uh, having done many statistical controls and actually showing that um, even controlling for the big, common, well-established um, economic correlates of criminal behaviour, things like GDP, um, there was still a statistical effect of belief in um, what the measure was, was a belief in hell um, in proportion to the belief in, in heaven. So again, some further evidence that people's belief in the uh, role of supernatural agents in punishing antisocial or selfish behaviour seemed to have a deterrent effect. So here's the core of the book, which was we have some empirical evidence that people do fear supernatural punishment and some empirical evidence that fearing supernatural punishment affects your behaviour and makes you more cooperative and less self-interested. And the question for an evolutionary biologist is why do you need religion to do that? What, what is it that makes um, supernatural punishment effective? And why would individuals believe that? Um, this is Nico Tinbergen. who won the Nobel Prize for his work in behavioural ecology. And he reminded us that we have to always pay attention to four different explanations of the causes of behaviour. The proximate explanation, which is the biological triggers which give rise to a behaviour. Um, the ultimate explanation, which is what is it for? How does it improve reproductive success? Um, there are two others, the developmental aspects. So how do these behaviours um, develop in organisms as they develop from um, babies into adults? And then finally, phylogenetic explanations, which is that perhaps you might do something not because it's a, um, an independent, evolved, adaptive um, trait in your lineage, but you've inherited it from a common ancestor. And the reason I showed this is because what I want to focus on here is solely the ultimate explanation. Um, what is it that religion does which improves Darwinian fitness? So the argument is basically that believers in principle should incur costs because they have to employ resources and time um, and constraints on their behaviour if they're going to conform to religious beliefs. And atheists don't. Um, they can do what they want. They don't incur any of these costs. Plus, they can exploit believers because they can free ride on the cooperation of, of uh, those who believe. Now, I'm sorry to kind of give all this in very reductionist, simplified terms, but this is sort of the way um, I approached it as an atheist evolutionary biologist, just thinking of the costs and benefits. And the, the conclusion of that is that atheists should outcompete believers, right? Unless there's some additional benefit that we're not accounting for. Or alternatively, perhaps because believers are actually avoiding some additional costs that we haven't accounted for. And this is why um, I decided to take this very seriously, because I think there was a very important turning point in human evolutionary history which made selfishness costly. Now, <clears throat> the first element of this is the development of theory of mind. And this is that I know that you know what someone else knows. And this is something that no other animal has. And it's really important because it means that suddenly 
our behaviour is subject to other people's knowledge that can have serious consequences for our own fitness. And this is something unique to humans. And the other thing which is also unique to humans is complex language. That um, the social exchange of information about what other people are doing suddenly can incur very serious material consequences. You can't just do something um, and get away with it because others can pass that information about your behaviour on and there can be consequences to pay later on. Now th these are both unique to humans and impose novel selective pressures and, I think, adaptive responses. Jesse Bering, who I mentioned earlier, has a very interesting paper suggesting that even very complex behaviours like murdering witnesses and blackmail and suicide, which is what he's working on at the moment, um, can be understood in an adaptive framework because of their very important social consequences. Now, <clears throat> I'm not sure what I think about that exactly, but the thing that I got out of his work was that there's a good side to this too. That things like confession and guilt and empathy, um, which also require theory of mind and are affected by complex language, can be highly adaptive. So the consequences are really important. There's suddenly these evolutionarily <coughs> normal costs of selfishness. At some point in human evolution, once theory of mind and complex language came along, um, reputation suddenly became even more important than it ever had been before. There was an increased probability of detection for selfish behaviour. People could find out what you had done, even if they weren't there to see it themselves. And then interestingly, punishment became much more severe as well. There could be third-party retaliation. If I am selfish and take something from Jeff, Jeff's friends can come back and uh, make me pay for it, even long after the event. And there's quite an interesting literature as well that while earlier on we said punishment was costly, so why would people punish? that actually punishment does not have to be that costly because of using alliances to exact the punishment. And there's a whole literature and some books on um, the role of weapons in um, <coughs> making punishment extremely effective. So I argue in the book that there was probably some very important selection pressure on counter mechanisms to get around this problem of the increased cost of selfishness in human evolutionary history. And you could imagine quite a few. But one of them is that a belief in supernatural punishment would act as a kind of evolutionary mind guard to deter yourself from selfish behaviour because it had become so costly. So it would moderate selfish motives, which are quite hard to control. Um, and this would be advantageous to the individual because it would help then avoid the real world retaliation and punishment that you <coughs> might otherwise get from group members. So I don't know how clear I've made that. I've said that so many times in giving talks over the years that to me it's become, um, uh, it sort of rattles off and I don't know if it makes sense. But I think in one paragraph it's basically the idea is selfishness among animals is quite common and they don't have to pay the consequences beyond the interaction partner they have. But with humans that's not true at all. All of a sudden there are serious material consequences for selfish behaviour. Um, even by 30 third parties, even long after the event. And that punishment can be very severe. And I think we had to adjust our behaviour in order to survive in this quite significant social minefield. So selfishness does, not, does no longer always pay. Oh, okay. I felt the need for a summary, and I obviously felt the need for a summary in constructing my slides as well. <laughs> So through human evolution at some point, doesn't matter when, those new cognitive mechanisms, theory of mind and complex language, created new costs of selfishness through retaliation and reputation. And we needed an a <coughs> solution. There could be many, but I think one very interesting one is the role of beliefs in supernatural punishment to uh, tamp down um, our selfish behaviour. Um, let me skip this section. This is an attempt to demonstrate to sort of sceptical economists and evolutionary biologists that there's a game theoretical logic to how a believer might outcompete a non-believer. But I think what might be more interesting is to focus on the role of atheists. So I'm going to skip to that bit. Except to mention that um, in the game theory literature, which is all about managing different possible errors, um, Pascal, who's the uh, name of the, the lecture series um, this evening, I think was the first person to recognise the logic of this, of course, in his idea that, you know, we don't know if God is uh, real or not, um, but what a big mistake it would be 
um, if we believed uh, that he was uh, not real, and he was. And there's a sort of modern evolutionary argument that suggests the same management of errors might have been important in <coughs> explaining why an individual belief in self-punishment, which constrains your own behavior, is the right mistake, if you like, to make to avoid uh, the costs of selfishness. But what about atheists? So many people say to me, okay, so if religion is so important, and supernatural punishment is so important in promoting cooperation, how do you explain um, atheists? How do they cooperate? And why is uh, atheism spreading, at least in some parts of the world? And my argument is that atheists actually are not immune from these beliefs and supernatural consequences um, for their behavior. And here's a very specific example. So, I don't know much about baseball. I'll know more about it by the end of the week. Um, but uh, I've read about the rally cap effects and how whole crowds will turn their cap around um, because they believe it will help their team win when they're in dire straits. And actually, this is not something unique to baseball, but across sports, you find that people will um, quite commonly um, invoke some kind of talismans or um, rituals to try and increase um, their performance or avoid negative consequences. Now, this is very different from religion, right? But my whole book is all about the cognitive mechanisms underlying um, beliefs in cause and effects and uh, negative consequences of our actions. So while religion and these kinds of um, things are extremely different, superstitions and so on are, so, are clearly very different, all I'm saying is there are some aspects of them which I think are similar and may help solve the same collective action problems. In Britain, we have our own version. Um, this is a game called cricket, lasts about five days and can end in a draw. Um, in 2005, England was very excited because we finally built, beat Australia in the ashes after about 20 years of, of losing. And the Times of London ran a, um, a survey after the game, basically saying, how did we win? We, we don't win ever cricket games against the Australians. And all of these people wrote in with all of these stories about how they had helped England win <laughs> by sitting in a certain spot on their mat at home, cutting the lawn to exactly the same height of grass as it was in the previous Trent Bridge test. Um, and there was just an outpouring of all of these vestigial supernatural beliefs that people had, you know, quite tongue in cheek, but nevertheless they did all these funny things because they, were, they didn't tempt fate um, to lose the game. So I think it's quite common, even among atheists, to find that they harbour these supernatural beliefs. And if you talk to a psychologist, they wouldn't be surprised by that at all. Superstitious beliefs are ubiquitous among atheists as well as believers. So <clears throat> superstition, I think, can actually solve some of these same collective action problems. Now, they might seem to be about rather random things, but I think many of them are, are actually to do with moral behaviour. Um, there are some very interesting examples. You think of karma, and that's of course tied up with um, a lot of uh, religious traditions. But many atheists have karmic-like beliefs. And the psychologists have um, investigated this in the laboratory, and they find that um, so-called just world beliefs are extremely powerful and extremely common. And this is the belief, even among atheists, that people get what they deserve, even when it's not uh, materially possible. So this is all about you know, modes of thought, which are actually quite common, right? Come up and just deserts, what goes around comes around. These are all aspects of s expectations of supernatural consequences of our behaviour. And the common property is that they all invoke theory of mind and what psychologists call the intentionality system. They're all about the expectation of some supernatural consequence for your behaviour. And they tap into these same underlying cognitive processes, which in... Um, Religious beliefs, um, of course, are related to supernatural punishment. We also know from the anthropologists and the psychologists that there are certain um, contexts and conditions which increase the incidence of superstition. In high stakes, uncertain environments where there's a distinct lack of control and stress or anxiety, you get much more superstition. And people have observed that um, this is why you get a lot of superstition in sports and actually in politics as well. Um, they're high stakes, you don't know what's going to happen, you do have some control over your performance, but you can't control um, the outcome of an interaction. 
Um, so a couple of examples, Tony Blair always wore the same shoes to Prime Minister's question times in the House of Commons. Um, Obama always carried a lucky poker chip in his pocket. Um, there's loads of good examples from sport, um, but you get the idea. So what I try and argue in the book is that atheists are not immune. They're doing exactly the same thing um, as religious belief in invoking superstition to try and um, deter self-interested and selfish behaviour. And people always say, well, <coughs> superstitions are not always about moral um, behaviour. And I agree. But I think often they are. Uh, these are four particular mechanisms underlying belief. So the cognitive psychology of religion literature have focused in particular on cause and effect. Very adaptive, we all have good um, mechanisms for identifying cause and effect. Mind-body dualism, the belief that uh, minds and bodies can be separate. Agency detection, that's uh, the sort of overspill we have for identifying agents in the environment as the causes of behaviour. And then the just world beliefs I mentioned before. And the point of this table is to note that all of these effects, which the psychologists have identified, don't have any particular positive bias, but they have been shown to have a negative bias, to favour the role of supernatural punishment rather than reward. And the cause and effect one is because it's very important to avoid costly mistakes more than um, seeking opportunities. And agency detection, that was the Morwedge study, that when things happen, people are much more likely to assign a cause if it was a negative, detrimental effect than a positive one. And uh, with just world beliefs, it tends to be that people think people get what they deserve when something b bad happens to them, not the other way around. Mm. So th here's some sort of interesting independent evidence that the way the human mind is set up, we are primed to believe in supernatural consequences for negative um, uh, behaviour rather than positive behaviour. So with five minutes to go, here's a few criticisms, um, which might anticipate some of the questions, but won't, I don't think, steal anyone's thunder. Um, I spent a few years in Edinburgh, as Andrew noted, and when the Pope came to town, the Scottish Humanist Society put up these big billboards around town, noting that two million Scots are good without God, meaning there are two million atheists in Scotland, um, and they don't need religion to be good. After five years there, I might dispute that, but... Uh, um, there was certainly this common argument in the literature that we don't need religion to be moral. I agree. But one thing that is very interesting is when you do surveys around the world and you ask people whether they believe you need religion to be moral, very high percentages um, of people respond that... Um, it is very difficult or not possible to, to um, be moral without religion. So the perception is there even if um, uh, the reality is not. Um, here's a few things which I think make supernatural punishments um, and religion as a whole extremely effective. So one criticism is often that, well, we have secular means of punishment. We don't need religion to do this. But if you think about secular punishment as constraints, it's quite costly and difficult to detect free riders, right? The police have a hard job tracking everyone down with uh, committing crimes. Punishment is costly as well, and it's only limited what you can do to punish people. There are always second order free riders, reprisals are always possible, um, and as a result, you get more first order free riders to begin with. If you just think through the logic of supernatural punishment, the detection of free riders is free and automatic. The punishment of free riders is also free and it's unlimited. You know, the punishment of God could be much more significant than a lifetime in prison. Second order free riders, there aren't any, nor can you have reprisals against the punisher. So at least from a logical point of view, there are special things about religion and supernatural punishment which I think make it a better policeman than any human can ever be. So let me just finish with this slide, which is to note that I'm not saying secular versions of policing are uh, no use. And this is a nice painting by uh, Jean-Paul uh, Proudhon, um, who has both justice um, and divine vengeance pursuing this murderer. Mm. And I think that's the reality, that um, in many societies today we have both religion and secular institutions um, that carry out punishment. But both of them are means of deterring self-interest 
um, and promoting cooperation. In, hu in the human past, we didn't have these modern um, institutions of justice, and religion may have been the only way to do it, or the most powerful way to do it. And today we still have the, um, religion doing its job, perhaps not as significantly as it used to, but why not have two sticks rather than one? Thank you very much. Oh, yeah, yeah sorry, the concluding slide was just a summary of what I've said, but I'll leave that so we have time for questions. Go ahead. No, that I can come back.